Today's lecture is on scientific realism, and in particular, Hilary Putnam's no miracles argument. Um, so I think this is the default view that most of us probably start out with is that, yes, yeah, science is so impressive. We're so used to using it in our everyday lives, um, and it's so successful that it must be getting at the truth, right? Our scientific theories must be true, or at least close to it, right? Um, and that's, I think, a reasonable view to take. Uh, so Hillary Putnam makes that into a formal argument. So let's just take a look real quickly. All right, so no one can deny science very successful, right? Here is a human being hanging out on the moon alive and that human being even made it home, right? That is just astounding, right? Um, and even more important in sort of the everyday our everyday existence is we can cure all these diseases that used to be fatal, right? Just antibiotics alone has extended our lifespan, right? Um, 100 years ago or so, right? People lived to be, you know, in their 30s. Um, now they live to be well into their 70s. Uh, we can split atoms, right? And destroy an entire city with a single bomb. I don't know if that's success exactly, right? But it's impressive, terrifying. Um, and Right, this is science. None of this would be possible without science, right? Um, and so you would be, it would be reasonable to think that that can't be an accident, right? That um, once our uh, understanding, right, our scientific understanding of the world picks up and we learn more and more, all these successes start to heap up, right? And there must be some connection, right? It must be that science is getting at something. That's the intuition, right? Seems reasonable. Again, that, right? I think this is the default view. Um, but we will see in the next lectures that the story is not so simple. It's actually not so easy um, to make that into a cogent argument. Uh, but let's start with Hillary Putman's, Putnam's uh, first attempt to formalize this intuition into an argument. Um, now, the Staley, if you read the Staley, chapter, which I uh, put, which I required, but you should read it, right, um, is uh, he takes a little example from the history of science to try to make it a little more clear how it can be sort of tough to say whether we know that a scientific theory is true or not, right? Because um, as science develops, we're getting farther and farther away from anything sort of observational, particularly in uh, particle physics. Things are getting pretty trippy and sort of starting to border maybe on metaphysics even sometimes, which we saw in the last lecture was a concern for logical positivists. Um, so Staley talks about uh, Paul Dirac, who's a physicist in the 20s. Um, they figured out a way to make behavior of electrons um, as described by quantum mechanics, which we've discussed is uh, pretty trippy. They're never until they're observed, they're not in any determinate position whatsoever. They behave very strangely. Um, and he wanted to make this consistent with Einstein's theory of relativity, which is sort of a theory of the very large, like the motions of like suns and planets and things and the, the gravitational fields of very large objects. Uh, so he thought he had a way of sort of matching these theories up. And I, I don't even understand the, the small details of this, so we're not get it, gonna get into the fine grain. But the broad idea was, um, he thought he could make these theories compatible, right? Relativity, quantum mechanics. But to make that happen, he had to posit a very sort of strange thing. He had to claim that there are electrons that exist with negative energy. I'm not talking about negative charge, right? But literally like less than zero energy, right? If that, if you can even sort of conceive of that. And here we have a little, just a little, Chart that I don't know if that helps, but we've got zero energy and we've got electrons above it that have some positive amount of energy, and then we have ones below it that have like negative energy. Um, so he posited like a, a sort of a sea of this sort of negative energy, right? Um, and it was a very weird thing to consider, but it simplified the mathematical model. And we saw, particularly in the Lewis account of laws, that Simplicity is uh, is a virtue in theories. Um, not only philosophers, but scientists also value it a great deal. 
Um, and it matched up, it made our theory match up with the evidence, with the observations, which is also something that's important to scientists and in particular to empiricists. Um, so even though it's pretty weird, and it's not clear, again, what sort of observation could ever tell you whether it's true or not, um, Dirac said, I think it's worthwhile to consider that there is an infinitely large sea of negatively charged electrons. Um, so this is the sort of thing that gets seriously entertained in physics, and it is so divorced from uh, obs. I mean, it's not totally divorced from observation, but um, it's pretty tough to say how we could observe it. Um, right. Remember uh, the Duhem problem, right? So certainly we can do experiments that might test this, but it has to be linked up with so many other theoretical posits that it's never going to be totally clear whether we could falsify this account or not, right? It'd be one of many, many assumptions that we're making. So even if we did a falsifying experiment, well, which one is the false part? It would be hard to say whether the C of negative electrons is ever true or false. So we'll come back to this as Staley does throughout the chapter, a sort of an example of the sort of thing that we worry about when we say, is science getting it right? Does this really weird thing actually exist? Um, okay, and more about it, right? So here's that cloud chamber you saw last week. Um, so there are uh, observations, predictions you can make. Um, so he did make a prediction says, look, if there were a tiny hole in this uniform sea of negative energy, right, um, it, would, it would behave exactly like a proton, except it would be very small. Um, so actually kind of what it would be is a positive electron, right, anti-electron, positron. Um, now, according to his theory, they would be very, very unstable, right? They would pop into existence and then combine back into the um, sea of negative energy very quickly. But the theory does predict that there are circumstances where we might be able to produce them in a lab. And this is what Carl Anderson actually did, right? So here's a cloud chamber. We've discussed how those allow you to photograph the trails left by subatomic particles. Um, and you can determine their charge by the direction they move, whether they're toward like a positively charged plate or a negatively charged plate. Um, and he found, in fact, that there were particles that were the size of electrons, right? And they were positively charged. Uh, so it seems like it made a successful prediction. Um, and that's supposed to be corroboration, right? It's supposed to be reason to think it's true. Um, so maybe there is this sea of negative energy. We'll return to it. Okay, so here is Hilary Putnam. Um, he has a one sentence argument for scientific realism, and it goes like this. Realism is the only philosophy that does not make the success of science a miracle. Um, so this is typically interpreted as a kind of inference for the best to the best explanation. Obviously, it's a one sentence argument. It's not uh, very detailed or explicit in sort of logic behind it, but people have spent some time trying to cash out what the logic of the argument is. And the best guess is that it's an inference to the best explanation. Um, so we have not yet discuss this form of argumentation. It's an inductive form of argumentation. So it's not deductive, right? It's not like modus ponens or modus tollens or one of those things. Um, so it's not gonna give us a guaranteed true conclusion from true premises, but, and we have spent a lot of time in week one sort of questioning whether induction was even a thing that was worthwhile. Um, but for now, uh, we're going to assume with the rest of humanity that it is worthwhile, right? We do do it a lot, regardless of, you know, Hume, what Hume says, um, right? Even if we can't totally justify that, um, no one's getting rid of induction anytime soon, right? So IBE is an inductive form of argument, and it goes like this. Uh, P is the case, whatever P might be, some state of affairs. Um, the explanation of P being the case is that Q is the case, right? That would explain why P is hanging around. Um, and so we say, okay, so Q must be, right? Um, maybe a way to make it more concrete, think about like all the detective shows or detective movies you've ever watched in your life, right? So what's P here? So let's say Nate's fingerprints are found on the murder weapon, um, his footprints are in the house, his DNA is at the scene, there's blood all over his clothes, whatever. So that's the P, that's the state of affairs that we know to be the case. 
Um, how could we explain all of this, right? Well, one explanation, uh, and maybe I'll argue I'm the prosecutor, I'm gonna argue that the best explanation of all this evidence is that is Q, Nate is the murderer, right? Um, right, and if that is in fact the best explanation of P, and we know P to be the case, then we can conclude Q. Um, not foolproof, it's inductive, right? But it's the sort of explanation we use all the time. Um, now, of course, this is exactly why I myself get a lawyer, right? And she is going to try to cook up an even better explanation of all this stuff. And then my IBE will be, right? So uh, maybe the new best explanation is that I was framed by the cops, right? And they have more evidence, more facts uh, that we can put in P. Um, write an email from whatever the chief of police saying, let's get this guy, Nate, let's plant evidence, right? Okay, well, we now we have a better explanation, right? And the same argument structure, right, would give us uh, the conclusion that Nate is someone else is the murderer, right? or it is a frame. Um, okay, so in either case, it's IBE, but that's how it works. So <clears throat> again, it's not deductively valid, and in fact, it looks like a deductive fallacy, right? It looks like affirming the consequence. So if you've taken logic, you may have probably run into that. Um, so it kind of gives us a conditional, right? It says, if Nate was the murderer, then his DNA would probably be at the scene, his fingerprints would be on the weapon, and so on. And we say, oh yeah, his DNA is at the scene, his fingerprints are the weapon, therefore Nate is the murderer. But that's basically like saying, if P, then Q, Q, therefore P. And that is not a deductively valid form of argument. It's sort of like saying, um, if Spot is human, then he's an animal. I mean, that's true, right, of any human. Um, and Spot is an animal, therefore he's human. Well, that's that's a bad argument, right? Because Spot could be a dog, Spot could be any kind of animal. Right? It could be a lizard. Um, we shouldn't conclude that he's human. So again, not deductively valid, but for certain circumstances, right, it can be a pretty good uh, form of inductive. It'll get us the right conclusion a lot of the time. So this will come up later in, in some of the other articles, right, when they're arguing against uh, Putnam's argument for scientific realism. They're saying, I don't, I don't know if I even think IBE is going to be appropriate, right, for this kind of argument at this point that Putnam trying to make. Oh, but let's analyze the no miracles argument as a kind of inference to the best explanation. So you might think of Putnam's argument as saying, Okay, we got two possible explanations, two complete competing explanations of the success of science, right? How we how we were able to land people on the moon, cure diseases, etc. So we got one explanation: the scientific theories are true, right? Um, we understand the world, right? Because we're getting it right, and we know the forces involved, right, in shooting things into space, and those allow us to predict where, right, a rocket will go if you shoot it into space. It'll hit, it'll land on the moon. And we can manipulate the world, right? We can, we understand how uh, microorganisms, microorganisms, right, uh, work in the body to cause disease, and we can manipulate this by introducing other substances, antibiotics, that will, right, cut that short. Okay, so that's one explanation. Our scientific theories are just true; they're getting it right, and that's what allows us to do all these great things. And and Hillary Putnam says the only other explanation that I can think of is that. We're just getting lucky all the time. It's literally, it's just a miracle, right? We have these bad theories, but we're still able to put people on the moon and cure diseases. Um, and he thinks that's just, he says that would be miraculous. So implicitly he's saying that's a bad explanation, right? It can't be luck, it can't be pure luck. Um, so since the miracle explanation is a worse explanation than the explanation that scientific theories are true, inference is the best explanation, right? The best explanation is the true one, so we should conclude our scientific theories are true. So, um, if that argument convinces you, then you probably believe in scientific realism, and scientific realism is the claim that scientific theories that achieve a certain level of success, um, sometimes those are called, we'll see they're called mature scientific theories, right? Um, they are probably at least approximately true. Um, and if you don't believe this claim, uh, you'll be an anti-realist. Um, and we'll see more, and, and you, at this moment you might think, who would be an anti-realist about something? Come on, right? We put people on the moon. Um, but anti-realists aren't necessarily going to deny that science has been successful. They will agree, yeah, it's, that's amazing, right? Um, 
usually they're just going to think that you can have a successful theory that isn't strictly speaking true. Right? So they're going to have another explanation for the success of science. And we'll get into that in the next lecture on Larry Loudon's pessimistic meta-index.